Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So here we are for this course called Democratic Processes and Social Movements and uh, we have reached uh, to our le lecture number 15 which is about class politics in India. I am Dr. Ruchi Shri and I teach at the PG Department of Political Science at uh, Bhagalpur University, Bihar. And uh, this course that we have designed for you is uh, titled Democratic Processes and Social Movements. So in that we have in a way uh, divided the course into two parts. So uh, first part which is about democratic processes where you are learning, you have learned about the institutional aspects of democracy. And in the second part, you are learning about the social movements. So we first started uh, from say lecture number 13 that we started discussing about development as a process. What is development process and how does it affect the social movements? Today's lecture is about class politics in India and here we are not focusing on any movement per se, but rather we are going to discuss about the different prevalent classes in India and also the historical background of those classes. So what happens is that, uh, that in most of the countries, there are different classes which play an important role in the politics of that country. Similarly, even in India, uh, there are different classes. For example, there is working class, then there is peasant class, uh, then there is uh, also the class of politicians. So political class is something that we are going to focus much more upon. So let me first begin with what and why of class, as in why are we going to discuss about class. So let me tell you what is class. Class is a social concept or it is a category by which we tell about the composition of a certain section of the society. So it is an all pervasive category and thus we need to contextualize it. So there can be business class, there can be political class, there can be working class. So there are different types of classes. And if you will look at the first word, the business, political, or working, then they tell you about the character, especially about their nature of work. So those who are involved into business, they will be called the business class. Those who are into politics, they are political class. Working class is something that is mostly about those who work in industries. So that is working class. So here I have first given you three examples to tell you that there is a presence of different classes in the same society. So it's not that there is just one type of class, but there are numerous classes. So primarily we use this concept of class in political economy. So class as a concept is primarily used in political economy, but at the same time, it is also used in disciplines like sociology and politics. So, if we talk about three disciplines, economics, sociology and politics, then it is central to economics, but partly peripheral for sociology and politics. So, what happens is that class politics is an important dimension to understand the political economy of any country. So political economy is shaped by the presence of different classes. So to begin with the concept of class, how did this idea of class become so uh, important or why did it uh, gain so much importance is primarily, uh, first of all it was Karl Marx who uses class in a different sense and then another thinker is Max Weber. So these two people use the term class in two different ways. Now let me tell you why and how. So while Marx focuses more on the economic aspect, 
Weber uses another term which is status. He says that there are different things about say a person's the way a person dresses up or what he eats all these things are the part of these aspects are part of the culture. So class also has a cultural aspect. So class is not just about the economic aspect but also about the cultural aspect. So whether it is about the material means of production, means of production, maybe you must have heard of the term MOP, means of production, or say possession of particular skills, any human's capital, or there are cultural traits, the way people behave or something. So that can be a symbolic capital or there can be social connections. So these are different ways of looking at class. So, for example, when we say working class, then working class is about a particular skill that all those who are workers in a company, they will be considered a working class. Or similarly, business class, those who are involved into business, they are, that is again a particular skill. Now, if we talk about cultural traits, sometimes referred to as symbolic capital, then it is about, for example, if it is based on say things like language, etc. So, for example, those who can speak in English, they are considered the elite class. They are considered those who are rich. They only know how to uh, talk in English. So, in that sense, it is about a cultural trait. Those who can speak in English or those who can't. Last point is the social connection. That's something called social capital is also determined by our class uh, identity. So, class basically influences a person's power. Now, this power vis-a-vis -vis the market as in uh, a person's purchasing capacity. So, class as a dimension tells us who can buy what. So, that is about your purchasing power is determined by your class. So, that is vis-a-vis -vis labor or money. So, if you have money, you can buy things. Similarly, if you have money, you can even buy labor means somebody else can do things for you. So these all are the things that we need to know about class as a background. So class is a crucial aspect of power relationship in any society. So these points I want you to uh, remember or to keep it at the backdrop in your mind when we proceed further in this lecture. The things that we will be discussing we will keep coming back to these ideas, the different notions of class, the different meanings of class. So to tell you, to, to summarize the two, three points that we discussed here, one is about its significance for the discipline. So it is very important for political economy as a discipline. And secondly, we said that class determines a person's purchasing power. So the person can buy uh, things from the market as well as the labor. Now we move on to the next slide. So the concept of class in social stratification. Now I am not sure if you are aware of the term social stratification. Social stratification is basically a way of dividing the society into different groups. So in India basically when we talk about social stratification in India, there are two ways. One is caste, another is class. So in your next lecture, you will uh, learn about caste in a great detail where I have talked about the class dimension, uh, sorry, the caste dimension as in why caste is so dominant in India. But here I am going to tell you about class. So let me quickly first tell you, while caste is determined by our birth, class is more about the economic status that we have. So caste identity cannot be changed. Whichever caste one is born in, the person will die also in the same caste. But that is not the thing with the class. Suppose somebody is born in a lower class, but if that person gets good education and is suppose if he is able to get good job then he may enter into middle class 
or if he is too fortunate and and he earns a lot of money then he even become part of upper class so the class identity can be changed in a lifetime but not the caste so stratification is about how people are placed in different social categories so social stratification tells us about the existence of different social categories it usually takes two forms namely inequality so what is inequality it leads to hierarchy inequalities of income can be ranked how to rank men and women or it can also be about linguistic difference so inequality is one and another is difference these two points are different from each other when we say inequality that means we consider that the two are of course there will be difference there also but in terms of inequality the two people will have will be treated differently for in, for instance if somebody is a brahmin or if somebody is a kshatriya or shudra so in a caste based society their treatment will be of two different kinds so and and that can be based on uh, they can be treated unequally in terms of difference for instance if somebody can speak english as a language and i speak hindi then it is not that we are unequal but two of us are different because two of us are speaking in two different languages so inequality and difference are two different ways of understanding social stratification now social stratification is not a synonym of either social inequality or social differentiation but it is about the way hierarchy and difference continuously act upon one another so what happens is that that in a society these two are the key principles hierarchy and difference means in a lifetime people often feel difference at some point and even they face hierarchy now to explain hierarchy to you if a society is structured in this way then the caste based hierarchy can be there this portion can be brahmin this portion will be kshatriya then third will be the vaishya and fourth will be the shudra so society being based like this this is the hierarchy means this at the top and rest at the down now the term class has a significant place in social stratification and its treatment differs as per three main theoretical premises and these three are one is the marxist way of looking at class second is the weberian way of looking at class and third is the functionalist aspect of class as in why did class emerge so the marxist will interpret it in a different way weber looks at it from the point of view of status and the functionalist say that the each group has a different function to play in the society thus we need to have different classes so class is a group of people within a society who possess the same socio economic status its main attribute is similar to economic circumstances so class is mostly determined by economic circumstances for example for marx class division was very important and he even talked about class struggle so he was referring to two classes one was the capitalist class those who will have the control upon uh, the industrial processes and the working class means those who will be working in the industries and marx will argue that it is likely that the two uh, classes will often have conflict with each other so let's first discuss class in marxist framework and basically you should remember that class is the most dominant category when we study about marxism as a framework so for karl marx classes are defined and structured by the relations about what about two things one about work and labor and two ownership of possession of property now when we talk about property then what do we mean it is about the means of production as well in the industry there are different kinds of relationships so some relationship is related to work then there is this labor force and another is that those who will have the ownership over the property rights so it is the capitalists who have the 
who have the the purchasing power due to that they are having the ownership of the company so what happened is that for marx he says that the entire human history is actually the history of class struggle so for marx class struggle and class division these are the two dominant ideas on which the entire marxian political economy is based next to these two the class division and class struggle he talks about two more ideas regarding class one is class in itself and second is class for itself now let me tell you quickly about what are these two one the class in itself is a group when the social group is uh, they share same relationship to the means of production so a class for itself is aware of its common interest for example the capitalists are driven by their logic of profit so they are class in itself so what happened is that he gives marx gave a call to the working class to unite for their fight against capitalism so capitalism as a system and the capitalist class they need to be abolished so that was the framework that marx was following now let's come to the critique of marx's framework so while marx was the one who started this idea of who gave so much importance to the idea of class but when weber started writing marx max weber max weber based his theory on criticism of what karl marx had said so weber proposed that there is a need to limit the idea of concept of class because there are there is presence of different groups since there are impersonal income distinctions so he asked to distinguish between class and social status so he said that there can there is a possibility of different kinds of collectivities there can be different groups of people means those who, there can be a presence of middle class there can be a presence of bureaucracy so how can you say that there will be only two groups that is uh, the capitalist and the working class so weber was opposed to what was told by karl marx some other uh, opponents means other than weber there are others also who have criticized marx marx's theory they have focused on the uh, functional interdependence so they say that it is not necessary that only these two will exist because there are different uh, roles which are required in the society and for those different roles you will need different groups of people so it is the function which will determine their role so this this is called the functionalist interdependence so not necessarily they will be against each other or not necessarily there will be a class struggle or class division kind of a uh, of a system but rather it can be interdependence so what are we trying to discuss we are saying that the functionality of class so class will it always be about in in opposition will two classes oppose each other or there is a possibility of interdependence so the functionalist the functional aspect focuses on the interdependence they say that different groups have a need for each other and thus different classes will not necessarily be opposed to each other or they will not be just uh, having conflict with each other but rather they will decide to work together so to have a cohesive relationship or adverse relationship because if they will be in opposition then there will be an adverse relationship means they are likely to fight but when there will be interdependence then they will have a cohesive relationship means they will have mutual respect for each other they would like to help each other so the same understanding of class if we have two different frameworks then we will understand understand class in two different ways so weber in his essay class status and party he says that there are these three ways of social stratification these are the three axes one is class second is status and third is power and he says that 
they may considered as independent from each other but at the same time they cannot be considered as completely separate from each other so in that sense weber was of the view that the class is something that also influences the status and power so class should not be seen completely in isolation but rather it should be seen in relationship with status and power so for example status our status can be something which we can see the kind of dressing one uh, goes for what one wears the branded things or or the kind of cars or shoes that a person uses so all these are about the status so the the it will depend on the kind of class that you belong to that will decide your status in the society and also uh the power for that matter so here again there are different ways of defining power for example the way gandhi defined the power for him it was the moral power which was very important so for gandhi what you show it off as what you are wearing or what uh, what the a car you are using that is not that important and for him it was the morality which was important so those are the things which we will uh, learn little later anyway so what happens is that status as a concept it's something that was the major contribution of max weber and he says that class must be seen in relationship of uh, status and power now now we come to the next slide which i have titled as caste and class so in the indian context basically how we see that there is a changing relationship between the two the class and caste so basically in india caste and class are often seen as the two category which are in sync with each other means most of the times the way we understand it is lower the caste will also mean lower the class this was the understanding at the beginning of 20th century means usually it so happened that lower caste also meant lower class so there was this inter interplay of caste and class is not entirely new but rather it was b r ambedkar who was one of the first thinkers to uh, pinpoint towards this and later on even ram ram manohar lohia he also engaged with the question of question around class so this kind of a class consciousness was something that was coming in indian society in the beginning of the 20th century itself both of them recognized that caste more than class is the central axis of political mobilization in india so in the indian society we focus more on caste vis-a-vis -vis class so though both these categories the caste and class they are the ways of social stratification but initially caste was more important in social stratification in comparison to class so in a famous lecture in hyderabad in 1952 lohia referred to caste as immobile class caste as immobile class and class as a mobile caste now let me try to explain this the mobile and immobile means something which can move and something which cannot move so immobile is another word for static something that can't move now if we say that caste is a, is immobile class means in the caste you cannot move your caste identity that is one and class as the mobile caste so basically he was equating class and caste that both of them are in a way they go hand in hand with each other but class is something that you can change but caste is something that you cannot change so caste remains static but class is something which one may change in one's lifetime so here we discussed about ambedkar and lohia and this is the beginning of 20th century we have entered into the 20th century that initially caste and class were seen as synonymous that we can see that lower the caste will be lower the class now ambedkar and lohia recognized that the objective conditions in newly independent 
India were not ripe for Marxist class politics. So both of them were saying that the class struggle that Lohia, uh, sorry, that Marx mentions in terms of a Marxian framework, what we say class struggle is not fitted for, does not fit for a country like India. Why? Because India is a caste ridden society. So the society is divided into different castes. So if you would like to apply the class framework, it will not work. So they said that a country that had very low level of industrialization, so industrialization had also not taken place, did not offer much hope or much scope for the class politics to emerge given the limited size of the organized labor force. So at the time of India's independence, uh, the working class was still weak in India because first of all, not too many industries were there. And also the working class was not so well organized as such. So uh, thus Ambedkar and Lohia are saying that it is rather caste which is more dominant as a category vis-a-vis -vis the class. Then they even said that most of India's population lived in poverty and they depended on state for their well-being. So state as an institution is something from which people have a lot of expectation. Since then, the objective conditions have now changed and hence a new class politics seems to be emerging. So these things, what we were talking about Ambedkar and Lohia, that was about the first half of 20th century. But if we talk about now, then the situation is gradually changing and now the class identity is gradually becoming important. And thus, we need to discuss uh, that it is worth keeping in mind that things have changed. And there is a scope for the class-based politics. But at the same time, class as a category has its influence on caste as well. And later on, we will see how these two are actually having an interplay with each other. Let me now discuss the idea of political class. So, so far we were discussing about just class as an idea. And now we are going to discuss about the idea of political class. Now, when we add the term political, then it uh, in a way limits its scope. It defines a certain aspect of class means that class which has its link with the politics or the class which influences the politics of a country. So political class as a category is an important concept to study in the discipline political sociology. Now, political sociology is basically the mix of po politics and sociology and this idea of say political class or one more uh, term which is used is called ruling class. So we gradually tried to enter into this idea of political dimension of class because the way Karl Marx had defined it then the economic aspect of class was most dominant and class was often understood in its um, economic understanding. So economic aspect was much more dominant and gradually we started molding it to its political aspect and that's how the idea of political class came up. So it was Mosca who is a political sociologist. He was from Italy. He was the one who first uses the term political class and he said that it refers to a small group of activists who are highly aware and they are active in politics. So Mosca was of the view that there is only a small section of the society, those people who are active into politics or those who are activists, they can be considered as, as political class. So those who shape the politics or those who want to play important role in politics and here shaping the politics in two ways those who are ruling as well as those who are in opposition because those who are in opposition they will also have a chance to win maybe next time if they win so the, this is political class so in political class basically political leadership is something which emerges out of political class so for example if 
the political class is a bigger category of this big, then the leadership will be a smaller chunk of the same. So, not that all who are part of political class, all of them will not have a chance of leadership. So, for example, if there are 100 people who are in political uh, class, then just 10 people will have the leadership ability. So, 10 people will become the leaders. So, this we have to remember that the idea of political class is a wider category, but the idea of political leadership is a smaller section of the same. Now, the third thing that comes up is the formation of political parties. So, the, the formation of political parties is also something which is one of the contributions of political class. So, those who are the members of political class, some of them may aspire to have a new political party. So, formation of political parties is also one of the contributions of political class. So, here you read about three things. One, political class two, political leadership and third, political parties. So, these are the three aspects which are important to understand. So, primarily the idea of recruitment that some politicians will be recruited, uh, some can be uh, just the volunteers and some can uh, think of contesting the elections. So, in the political class also, not that all the members are equally ambitious, but rather we see that the different people in political class they aspire to play different roles. Now, let us move to class based political mobilization in India. So, has there been anything like political mobilization in India and did class play any important role in that? Because here we are talking about some states where class based mobilization has taken place. For example, two states here I have given you the example of which are West Bengal and Kerala. Now, does something come to your mind that why these two states? Then the reason is that there is this presence of left political parties. So, what happens is that for a class based political mobilization, you have to have class consciousness. Now, this term class consciousness is something that we need to spend little more time on, time on because class struggle, division and consciousness. Consciousness is another word for say something like awareness. Awareness is a more popular term that we use. But when we say consciousness, then it is about becoming conscious of one's identity. So, class consciousness is something which brings unity within a class. For example, if there is a working class and if they first become conscious about themselves, then they may demand for themselves that their working hours should be less or that they should, they should have a weekly holiday, things like that. In order to get your demand fulfilled, there is a need to have unity within that group and that group can be a class. It can be a working class, it can be a political class. So, class consciousness plays an important role when it comes to political mobilization. What is political mobilization? When you try to mobilize the masses for some kind of political gain, then it leads to political mobilization. For example, to get reservation, if there is a certain caste group that wants itself to get the benefit of reservation, then they will sit on protests or then they will fight for themselves that they should be given that kind of a right. So, for that you need to have political mobilization. So, usually political mobilization is for some or the other cause. You need to have a cause for mobilization. Then the next point is that there is a strong presence or complete absence of the left parties. That makes the difference in the state wise differing situation. Now, what is the key point that I have mentioned here in the beginning is that class based 
political mobilization took place in West Bengal and Kerala. But in the neighboring uh, state, for example, Bihar is quite close to West Bengal, but there is no class consciousness there or even the presence of left parties is very, very weak. So those states which will not have active left political parties, then it is very less likely that there will be class consciousness among the people. So class consciousness is very important to have. Uh, the class based political mobilization. So in India, there are very few states where we get to see the political mobilization based on class. Then another role is played by the political leadership. So along with political parties, even the leadership plays an important role in class mobilization. If the leaders will uh, try to mobilize the people in the name of class, means their, their economic uh, status, then it is likely that that particular state's uh, population will have a kind of class mobilization, class based political mobilization. So uh, in this slide, I have mentioned this class struggle, class division, there is always a class uh, division in the society and Marx stresses on this point that every uh, society will actually will certainly have class struggle. But for class consciousness, you need to have a kind of awareness among the people. For example, if the working class becomes aware that it has to fight for its rights, so for that it will need its class consciousness. Now in the next slide, I have mentioned about four important classes which have influenced the politics in India. One is the working class that in India there has been a working class, though not very uh, empowered one as such or that their number is also not that high. Second is the capitalist class, third is the agrarian class and fourth is the middle class. Now for working class, there have to be industries, those who will work in the industries, the workers. Capitalist class, those who will the owning the, those who will be the owners of the industries. The agrarian class, again it is about the farmers, so rich farmers and poor farmers. And middle class is, middle class is again the in-between kind of a category. It's neither too rich in between the rich and poor. We call them the middle class. We have a separate, we have separate slides on middle class where we will talk about who are middle class and why there is a lack of unanimity on this that who is the middle class in India. So let me quickly uh, move on to slide wise one slide we will be doing on the working class then the next slide on capitalist class in order to understand their nature in Indian context the working class so mainly two organizations were made in uh, in the first half of 20th century first one was all India trade union congress AITUC all India trade union congress was the first attempt to, to mobilize the working uh, class and to have a group of them. So this was an institutional structure or the first kind of organization that was created for the working class in the 1920. And here you can also recall that it is right after the Russian revolution in 1917. So Russian revolution actually led to the strengthening of working classes in different countries of the world. So all over the world, those who were working in the industries, the working class started getting united. So as a result, such organizations as AITUC, we also get to see that other countries also had some working uh, class groups who were demanding for better conditions of work. 
that they should have a weekly off or their working hours should be uh, say eight hours that kind of demands were coming up other than aituc another organization which came up was indian national trade union congress intuc intuc so itec and intuc this an uh, intuc was established in 1947 so gradually the working class in india started uh, gaining ground and they tried to be united so when we loosely define who who is uh, working class or whom we call working class because are all those people who are working are they part of the working class then we say no because loosely we define as those who do not have college education who have studied only till school or those who have no education as such they can be part of the working class and they are often divided into four parts one they are unskilled laborers means as such they do not have any skill so for example uh, when we ask any labor to clean our ground or things like that they don't have any skill as such so they are called the unskilled laborers second group is that of artisans so those who are involved in the artistic activities they are called the artisans third is that of the out workers means those who sometimes migrate to other parts to work they are called the out workers then the fourth are the factory workers so these four categories come under the working class so working class movement for the betterment of working condition took place in the pre independence days and we see that there is a disunity among the workers and there is a lack of political consciousness in india so in india we don't see a kind of working class is not so powerful in india the reason is that they are often divided into different groups one that they come under the unorganized labor means they do not have their own union kind of thing second they are often divided by their ideological leanings also some workers may have marxist orientation some may have their uh, non marxist orientation so many a times they are not united so these are some of the reasons that we find a lack of political consciousness in the working class now coming to the capitalist class the capitalist class in india is also having the pre independence even in the working class also i told you about the pre independence as well as post independence now in capitalist class basically in india we talk about the people like tatas birla bajaj or nowadays we say a lot about ambani so these are some of the business families they they compose the capitalist class of india so there was this growth of capitalist class during the colonial phase in india and they played an important role in indian national movement they gave uh, they gave large sum to the organization congress and that's how congress was able to congress was funded by the capitalists at that times people like jamna lal das bajaj uh, or even tata these were the people who were uh, funding the congress so even in the post independence period these groups the tata birla bajaj etc uh, they are the major companies in india the indian companies and now many of these for example uh, even ambani's that reliance industries they are now having their business overseas means as we have the other companies here in india for example coca cola is an american company so american companies have their ventures in india now similarly even the indian companies have their ventures worldwide for example uh, reliance industries they have set up numerous uh, companies in different parts of africa or even latin america so that ways we get to see that the indian capitalist class is making its presence felt in the other parts of the world then the last point that i have mentioned is that there is this emergence of dalit capitalism so now there are people of dalit caste also that there is a capitalism kind of a tendency and a capitalist class is emerging among the dalits also now the next i have mentioned is the agrarian class so there are three groups in the agrarian class one is the of the land owners those who own the land 
Second is that of the tenants. Tenants are the ones who do not have land and they work on the lands of the landowner. And third is the laborers. So Daniel Thorner, he calls them Malik, Kisan and Mazdoor. So landowners are the Malik, tenants are the Kisan, laborers are Mazdoor. So within Kisan, there can be two kinds of categories. I, it, they can either be the ones who have small pieces of land as well as there can be those who do not have land. But Mazdoors are certainly the ones who do not have any land and they just have to work on either with Kisan or with Malik. Now here in agrarian class mainly the division of labor is based on specific tasks means who will do what will be decided by their location in this class structure. For example, the landowners they hardly do any physical labor as such because they have a control on the land so they can get their work done. So for them it is just to give the command that what the Kisan will do or what the laborers will do. Now if we look at agricultural sector then the role of agriculture in economic development is there. For example, why are we studying about agrarian class is because the agricultural sector also composes an important part of the our economic development. Second, it has a relative importance vis-a-vis -vis the industry and service sector. So for your industrial sector also you need some of the agrarian production and those are the things also which we need to have. Third, that there is a changing nature of agrarian relations means the pattern of what was the percentage of people who were landowners or those who were tenants. So those percentage also keeps like there is a change in that. So after the abolition of Jamindari system, many of the erstwhile Jamindars are no more remained with land. So such composition, the agrarian relation is changing. The last point that I have mentioned is that the relative backwardness of this sector means the agricultural sector is no more contributing a lot to the GDP. So for instance, while in 1950-51, that means when we became independent, at that time 51.9% means almost 52% of our GDP came from the agricultural sector, which has now come down to as less as 13.7%. So not even 15%. That is uh, that that too the data I have brought is almost 10 years old, 10, uh, 2012-13. Maybe uh, we need to check that what is the recent uh, data. But certainly the contribution which agricultural sector has to the GDP is quite worrisome. So that is the agrarian class, the class which is dependent on agriculture. Now coming to the middle class. Middle class is another category which is again very important role it plays in the Indian politics. It is a kind of an omnipresent or fuzzy category means it is one of the most popularly used concept middle class. In fact, more than half the population comes under middle class. So there is a lack of unanimity among the scholars on its definition. How to define middle class? Who is middle class or what is middle class? So Shashi Tharoor in one of the articles called who is this middle class? He says that around 300 to 350 million in India are actually the part of middle class. And another person, another person named Veer Sangvi, he writes in his article to India that the population is around 200 million. So here you can see that as such to have the exact number is difficult because whether we take income as the basis, who has how much income will be the basis or a certain lifestyle that is something which is important to understand why we do not have a consensus. So Sangvi writes that middle class is a heterogeneous group means there is a lack of homogeneity we cannot have one precise definition due to the level of education, profession and lifestyle. So these are the indicators of status and now you can recall what we were studying about Max Weber, that Max Weber also talked about status, that the class is defined by status. 
So he mentions there are three main characteristics. One, that there is new lifestyle. Means the middle class population is usually ready to take up new lifestyles. Then second is the ownership of certain economic assets. For example, TV, refrigerators, etc. These are the gadgets which mostly the middle class have the ownership. And then third is the consciousness of belonging to middle class. Means those who belong to the middle class, they know that, okay, we are the middle class. So middle class is also about adopting that tag for oneself that, okay, we are middle class. Now, here I have talked about political dominance of the middle class. So why there is a political dominance? Because they are the largest in the number. So larger the number, you are likely to be more dominant. So this is the first and foremost. So in Bengal, the term Bhadralok is used. Bhadralok means uh, good people or uh, and in that they were considered, for example, those people who are clerks or teachers, doctors, lawyers, means uh, the class that had a salaried income, means every month you have a permanent income that it will come every month. Uh, but for the others, for example, those who are farmers, they do not have a fixed income as such or every month they will have an income that is not there. So what happens is that if there is drought or if there is flood, then the entire uh, food crop may go waste and then that will lead to poverty of the farmers. But that is not the case with the salaried class. They know that every month at the beginning of the month, they will have the salary. So this Bhadra Lok actually started shaping the idea of middle class. So there was this emergence of off late, we say numerous categories of urban and rural middle class, those who live in the cities and those who live in the villages. So that ways we call them the rural and urban middle class. Then there is also this global middle class, means those who are NRIs, non-resident Indians. So NRIs also compose an important part of the global middle class. Then there is upper middle class, there is lower middle class, etc. So you can understand that middle class itself has an idea, it's so varied. It can have different interpretations as per the context. Now there is also an emergence of Dalit middle class. So I told you about the Dalit capitalists in the previous slide and here I'm talking about the Dalit middle class. And what has happened is that there is formation of numerous political parties, for example, Samajwadi party and Bahujan Samajwadi party, which led to the empowerment of Dalits in not just UP, but also in other states of North India. So this Dalit middle class started becoming very conscious of their own political power. Now, another thing that we see is that there is a kind of disillusionment with politics, means there are those who are not so happy about they don't have high hopes from politics. So that you can see in uh, a movie like Rang De Basanti, if you would have seen that there is a group of youth who are not happy about the way the politics is functioning. Or you also have the example of Anna Andolan, which eventually led to, which eventually led to Aam Admi Party's formation. So these are the things that tell us about the middle class disillusionment. Now, next is that I have mentioned is middle class dualism means their involvement in environmentalism. So sometimes they want to have a good lifestyle means they want to keep changing their cars in every five years. But at the same time, they also say that, oh, we are the activists and we want to save the environment. So that way they keep talking in terms of us versus them. So sometimes if they look at the rich, then they blame the rich being responsible for all of the problems. Sometimes they keep blaming the poor for the problems, but they safeguard themselves that we, the middle class are the best. So that is also another notion, which is a kind of dualism. Now we move on to the conclusion. So let me quickly first tell you that what all did we learn in this uh, chapter? We were talking about the class as an idea. What is class as a concept? Then we studied about the Indian context, 
in primarily in the pre independence period uh, what was the idea of working class or agrarian class so i told you about four different classes especially working class agricultural class capitalist class and uh, the fourth was the middle class these four classes i mentioned to you in order to make you understand that the class plays an important role in indian politics now to conclude we may say that there is a changing nature of class in the pre independence and post independence india and i haven't mentioned here but i can rather say that in the post liberalization it is further changing so we come across the emergence of dalit middle class to dalit capitalist class etc now middle class has also moved from a homogeneous to heterogeneous character so in the beginning middle class was considered as the ones who were the salaried class the bhadra lok in bengal but now the middle class has become a bigger category even the nris or the global uh, global middle class dalit middle class so there is no homogeneity but rather there are different groups who come under middle class so there is this idea of new middle class now we talk about the new middle class that they they have this awareness about their market oriented kind of their professional interests they are quite aware of and they have a political orientation also so as per their uh, preferences they may choose their political weightage and here i'll give you the example how uh, like 3 4 years back during the election in delhi some of the people were saying that for cm we will choose kejriwal so aam aadmi party but for pm we will choose modi so middle class has this orientation they know what is good for them so for the sense so as such the ideological orientation is not that they will stick to one party so they will see whatever suits them better they will change their uh, motives likewise now agrarian class is no more significant as it was in the pre independence days so there is a decline in in the importance of agrarian class then there is a corporate economy which has uh, led to corporate class so that's also another thing that there are it sector employees and there is this role of nris who are part of the corporate class so the last point that i want to mention is that that class and politics they tend to shape each other and that was the thing in the pre independence days as well as now in the post independence so with that i bring the lecture to an end and here are some of the references which you may uh, read especially the last article by john harris the class and politics it's something that you must read and these articles also you may read who is the middle class or to india so i hope you enjoyed the lecture and uh, with that i would like to end thank you so much Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams, but I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude. immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says 
that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.